This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Before we get into the episode today, I want to take a little bit of time. Uh, my Instagram account, at J. Scott Outdoors, had, uh, had uh, overwhelming response uh, and a lot of comments from the listeners. Uh, Dialed In Hunter says, I love the podcast. Keep it up. Uh, get dot grit says great podcast the episode with gohunt.com got the wheels turning in my head can't wait for more upcoming episodes uh, mr underscore spar sparasha i came across your podcast keep up the good work i got a late start in hunting but i'm trying to learn as much as i can and thanks for the help And Colton underscore Johnson, uh, listen to some of your podcasts today, man. They are awesome. I just want to thank you guys uh, for listening to the podcast. And I want to thank you for those of you who send me uh, emails at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com and uh, send me uh, comments on Instagram and through Facebook. Um, I want to let you guys know that you can follow along at J. Scott Outdoors Facebook page, uh, J. Scott Outdoors on YouTube. Uh, We've got a growing YouTube channel with a lot of elk and deer and sheep and turkey and fishing and all sorts of hunting videos. Um, J. Scott Outdoors on YouTube and then jscottoutdoors.com. I uh, just want to thank you guys for all the support you've given us uh, here over the last month in this infancy of the podcast, and um, I am going to do my best here to uh, make sure that we bring a lot of uh, real good episodes here for you. Uh, today we have a real special guest, uh, John Herzer of Blackfoot River Outfitters, so let's get into the show. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast brought to you by the Go Hunt Insider. Today we have John Herzer, who is a, a guide and outfitter in uh, Missoula, Montana. For He owns and operates Blackfoot River Outfitters and has been a guide for over 25 years in that area. And I've had the fortune about 10 years, 11 years ago, uh, my wife and I, Jean, fished uh, with John. We stayed about a week in Missoula and fished with John and his brother and, and um, had a great time fishing the Clark Fork and the Bitterroot and some of the rivers around the area. Uh, John is, uh, runs a very successful uh, guide operation, Blackfoot River Outfitters. And um, John, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, Jay. Good to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking forward to this episode. Um, you're, you know, I can truly say that you're one of the guys that got my wife uh, really fired up about fly fishing. I remember we went up uh, the Bitterroot Valley and we put in somewhere where you had to kind of drag the raft down a hill and, and um, uh, she proceeded to just really, you put her on a bunch of fish that day and she just had a great time. And, you know, it kind of created a, a love uh, for fly fishing for her, and she's actually become a really good fly fisher woman. And um, I credit you for, you know, kind of lighting the fire there. So I thank you for that. Well, I, I appreciate it. And I remember her being a quick learn, uh, quick. <laughs> she, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, she might have fished you, Jay. Uh, and, and it happens all the time. <laughs> so I, I, I'm often known as the guy that's uh, wife likes to fly fish. So. Yeah. Um, with that being said, we had a fantastic time up there, and, and um, Gene and I have been able to fish a lot of places since then, and, and so I give you credit. Um, John, what's your background um, in, in, in the outdoors and fishing and, and what have you? Well, I, uh, you know, I've been hunting and fishing all my life. I grew up in Colorado, and in central Colorado, in a little town called Buena Vista, right in the middle of the mountains, and my father tied flies you know when i was just a little guy so i was tying flies by the time i was eight and uh you know hunted rabbits when i was 10 or something and uh, we would i would 
spend a lot of time on a creek that went through the town of Buena Vista, a little Cottonwood Creek, and I never let school get in the way of my education. I was down there four <laughs> times than not, for sure. I would uh, leave a note when I was maybe in junior high and tell my parents, yeah, my homework's done, and I'm down at the creek fishing, and half of that was true. So, uh, yeah, I just I spent a lot of time uh, in Colorado growing up in a hunting and fishing environment with my, my family, and we did a lot of camping, a lot of backpacking in the high lakes. And then I moved here, I guess, in 1990 with my then girlfriend and now wife, uh, who is a a partner in the business with me, Terry. And, you know, we we loved Colorado, but boy, being in Montana, we were on Rock Creek one day and in February, nobody fished Rock Creek then in the winter. And there were about 60 head of sheep on one side of the hill and about 140 elk poured over this ridge in the evening toward us and a moose walked across in front of us. (laughs) <laughs> we caught about 80 fish out of this hole. Literally, it was ridiculous, uh, nymph fishing. And, she, you know, I looked at her. I said, why would we live anywhere else? And yeah. um, so that's when we moved here. And, and the rest is sort of history, I suppose. So I've been guiding here for about 25 years. Uh, we focus on – I used to be a whitewater guide, too. I was a whitewater guide in Colorado and, and around in some various places in the world on the Zambezi and um, all across the western United States. But uh, now we just – the worst thing that can happen now is people don't catch a fish, and they might think it's going to kill them, but I know it's probably not like Class 5 whitewater that might actually kill them. <laughs> uh, we focus on fly fishing around here now, and then on my off time, I just go bow hunting, you know, and that's 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 my passion. So I love to fish, but I live to hunt, and I haven't uh, pushed that limit to make that my business, too, because uh, I don't think it's quite the same. Sure. Absolutely. I understand what you're saying. Uh Tell me about the waters you fish around there. I mean, uh, having been to Missoula, um, there's a lot of options. Um, so maybe tell me about all the different waters you fish uh, right out of out of Missoula there. Yeah, that's that's a, a great thing to point at because out of Missoula, leaving our shop right here in downtown Missoula, within an hour and a half drive, we can we can go to over 400 miles of floatable fishable water. Uh, that's not including all these little side creeks that you can't put a boat in and lakes that you can hike into and things like that. So it's it's a pretty special place. But the primary uh, rivers that we float are all tributaries of the Clark Fork. It's actually the Clark Fork of the Columbia. We're on the west side of the divide, so all the water runs um, out to the Pacific here, as opposed to over on the Missouri, which all that stuff runs Atlantic and Mississippi side, right? And sure. uh, those would be uh, the Clark Fork comes in and meets the Rock Creek at about 20 miles out of town, just east of here, at uh, um, just a few more miles closer to town, about 15 miles out, then the Blackfoot meets the Clark Fork, and then right in town, the Bitterroot meets the Clark Fork. And every one of those rivers has at least about 80 miles of of water on those to fish. And then the Clark Fork extends on down below Missoula, uh, heading west and north um, to the Idaho border for another 120 miles. So those are the primary floating rivers that we do, but we also have permits for just about every river in the state. I mean, I think I have, I I counted this up one time, I think I have historical use on 21 waters in the state, and you know, the Big Hole, the Beaverhead, the Smith River, which is a beautiful five-day, four-night camp out, really uh, exceptional trip. Um, We have permits through the through the Alberton Gorge is kind of a whitewater section of, of the Clark Fork just below Missoula. We have wade fishing permits on Upper Rock Creek, which there's only, I think, three or four of those. So we we um, have the ability to go to a lot of different places in addition to just these places right here in Missoula. Absolutely. Fantastic waters, beautiful area. If 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 you had to pick one that you said, this is my favorite float, this is my you know, this is the river that, you know, if I only could choose one, could you pick one and which one would it be? Well, I'm, I guess, you know, I'm partial to the Blackfoot. That's the reason we named our, our company Blackfoot River Operators, but because it just has such a variety of water. I mean, I love fishing the Clark Fork, but it, it you know, as you know, most of these rivers around here have distinct qualities for each one. You know, the Bitterroot is more undercut banks and log jams and riffle runs. The Clark Fork's big, wide, slow-moving stream, more similar to the Missouri. The Blackfoot is more like the waters that I grew up on in Colorado. It's a fast, big, powerful stream with uh, big granitic boulders, you know, and deep runs. And even if it's running as, as really as low as it gets in the summer at 500 cubic feet per second, you can run a raft down it and still fish. 
or it'll get up to 10,000 CFS and we'll still fish it. And it just has uh, it has such a variety. I think that would be my favorite. And, and I'm kind of partial to streamer fishing, too. And I would think that it, it probably historically is the best streamer fishing around in the Missoula area. So I'd, I'd have to pick that. And then there's a stretch of it right in the middle that has the most rocks, the most rapids. And uh, in that section, um, just which is about 15, 18 miles uh, east of Missoula, that would be my favorite stretch. And, John, you mentioned streamer fishing. I've... Uh, I really enjoy streamer fishing as well, and I want to I want to talk to you. There's a guy wanting to book a trip right there. Right, Kinsley will get it. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about streamers and uh, give me your ideal conditions for fishing streamers on on the Blackfoot or or any uh, river for that matter. Um, talk to me a little bit about. If you see a forecast of a day coming, what are you looking for, and maybe what colors are you going to throw? What are you going to start off with? Maybe walk me through some of that. Sure, and that's that's great because I probably am not quite uh, typical of most guides. I think across the West, most people consider streamer fishing. They like it best in the fall when the brown trout are getting pre-spawn and they're getting aggressive. They're getting into smaller water. Um, but to be honest, I I'm a hunter, right? I want to go hunting in the fall. And I think the best streamer fishing is in the spring. Right now in April, it's hard to beat. And in this year, as it turns out, the water's up pretty high for this time of year, which makes it good for streamer fishing. But the best streamer fishing, I think, of the year uh, typically occurs in June. And given uh, climate change, it's hard to say when. It used to be the week of June 20th. I could feel pretty good about saying that. But now that week was June 11th last year. And that's when the river is bank full, really high, um, and, and up in, in the willows, and it's kind of green, not brown, but green. And it's I think it's counterintuitive. A lot of people think that uh, the fish are more concentrated when the river is low, and I would argue that it's just the opposite, that those fish are concentrated against the banks and on the inside corners when the water's high. So we, instead of doing an eight-mile float in a day, we might do 18 miles, and we'll go from sure. inside to inside and, and throw those streamers back slightly behind the boat and kind of tighten them up and do a slow – slow twitch um there's nothing more fun than than stripping streamers really fast and you can do that in august on a rainy cold day and catch a few fish but the biggest fish in the river are really they're scavengers right they want it low and slow so we're that's what our target fish are the biggest ones that live in there and when we're streamer fishing and the way to get those is when the water is really high they're shoved up against the banks and typically also jay that's uh when when the salmon flies are hatching sure right? so a lot of those big fish they follow that migration of salmon fly uh, nymphs to the bank. And I think that doubles uh, the reason they're kind of pressed up against the bank. So you can take some exceptionally large fish in real skinny water, um, especially in the inside corner ripples. You throw it way up next to the bank, I mean, within inches of water. And those fish have been following those nymphs up in there, and they're out of the heavy current because the water's high. And I think it just uh, makes for the best streamer fishing. And and because those those stone those samifly nymphs are crawling for the bank, trying to get on the bank, and so and they're big. And then here you come with yes. a streamer; they're already looking for a big meal. Of course, they're going to eat your streamer. That and and another great technique is uh, we do a bunny and a bead. So we'll have a big bunny fly, uh, some kind of bunny um, minnow type streamer, and we'll follow that up with a double bead stone nymph or even a little black woolly bugger that oftentimes looks like a stone fly nymph. So I think that big streamer, even if they don't eat that, they'll see that, uh, they'll see the streamer that gets their attention. And then they go over there and they've been eating sa salmon fly nymphs all day. Um, so they go ahead and just eat that automatically if they don't eat the streamer. Another great thing is just tying a, a San Juan worm behind it, which is odd because Whoever saw a worm swimming downstream, <laughs> it certainly uh, a lot of people are again, they don't like to use San Juan worms. And I'm like, that's fine. You just eliminated the opportunity to catch about 80 percent of the fish in the river because yeah, the exactly. biggest fish in the river will eat those San Juan worms. And it's odd that they'll eat them within moving. 10 inches or 12 inches behind a big fat streamer dragging along. I, you know, I'm no fish, but I just know how to catch them and I know it works. So we use that technique a lot. That's awesome. John, I wanted to ask you about, so you're fishing inside corners, mm -hmm. in, inside seams. So let's say you're coming down the river and the inside pocket's coming up on the right, mm -hmm. let's say, say river right, mm -hmm. and do you instruct your guys to throw it into the slack water and throw an upstream mend or a downstream mend, and then do they immediately start 
tightening it up, or do they do they skitter it a little bit, or kind of what is the exact technique you would offer? You, you're having really this is pretty. <laughs> this is exactly the kind of stuff that we talk about with our clients every day, right? We kind of explain that, and and that's what separates those who are catching a couple fish a day and those who catch a lot of those big ones in those prime conditions. Is those casts have to be perfect, and the boat boat position is probably as important or more important than the bug position because if your boat's too far away from that inside corner and for your for your listeners you know we're talking about river river right river left that's looking downstream floating downstream and on this situation you're talking about the river's going around a, a bend and it's circling into the right side the most of the current's going to the left side of the river and the softer water the slower water is on the right side and getting right. the boat into position slowed down to the proper speed so you can pitch those just in there where you're sand, in that slow water and high up on the ripple. Right, many, right up in the pocket, right, right in the corner, right? What I call yeah. trap. Yeah, right yeah. where the water in the back eddy is coming back up and touching the ripple. And that's where most of the food – this is just like bow hunting for, for whitetails, right? You want to find the best, most productive spot that funnels those – those whitetails into the skinniest spot and in the, pin, the pinch different, point yeah. right i mean i want to yeah. i want to put my fly exactly where the best possible chance is because really it's a matter of statistics just like bow hunting um i want to be able to make sure that fly is in front of the most fish most of the time during the day and the way to do that is right in the, what i call that trap where the back eddy's touching the current going downstream and the further up in there you get it the better off it is and then just tighten it up straight away and I don't really strip it out fast. Late in August when we're fishing uh, smaller streamers and we're moving them real quick, that's fun. Those fish are more aggressive. But when the water's high or in the spring like it is now, typically you want it low and slow. So all we do is tighten it up, maybe give it a couple bumps, and then let it glide. And then a couple more bumps and let it glide. And the takes on those, is it a, is it a subtle, real stern take or is it a, you know – is it just a tightening of the line and boom, well, they're on? Of what, what kind of um, you know, we, we can't legally fish for bull trout here in Montana. I don't know, or in this part of Montana, you can, but you, incidentally, you're going to catch some. And uh, the bull trout, a lot of times, will just grab it and just hang on, right? So you just almost, pipe, almost like you're snagged. Like you're snagged, exactly. I tell people, don't trust a snag, set every time. And, and we use heavy tippet. We're, we're using ot tippet, to, which is like 15-pound test of the first fly. And at least 10 pound, maybe 12 pound, 1x to the second ply. So you're going to dull some hooks up. You're going to lose some bugs. That's just part of the game. But you want to lean on them pretty good. And the brown trout typically will smack it pretty hard. Um, and the cutties around here, we have wonderful West Slope cutthroats and, na and native fish, really aggressive predators. And uh, they they get on it pretty hard too. They're really they're chasers. You know they like to chase down bait and hit it pretty hard. So the cutthroats here, uh, especially on the black, but are really aggressive predators so in that in that period of time when you when that we're talking about right off the bat first thing you know first fly what color is kind of your go-to i start with this color you know i like kind of natural streamers and I, I always double down so i'll either have a lighter colored streamer and a and a darker colored trailing fly or vice versa and i don't know that it really matters unless i know there's a lot of salmon flies out then typically i go with a lighter streamer being yellow tan white you know and lighter and, and brighter i should say and, sure. and trail that up with a darker uh, nymph or a little black bugger brown bugger something like that maybe even a double bead stone um so i kind of that way i hit both bases yeah yeah, and and I know from taking my buddies and stuff downriver when I'm floating and they're fishing streamers, you know, a lot of times you have to kind of get on them to say, look, you need to throw that, say you're moving now, yeah. you're moving, you need to throw that where it almost hits up on the bank and, and you're going to lose a fly or two or you're going to have to, you know, pull a tree out, you know, with the odd X yeah. tippet that you're using. But those fish are laying in those soft pockets right along the bank because they're trying to seek shelter, and that's the only place they can get where they can still feed and not, ex you know, exert a lot of energy. Um, yeah, do you do the same thing with your clients as far as tell them get them right on the bank? Dead on. I don't know if you remember, but I'm I'm pretty uh, type AAA guide, right? When I'm on, when I'm telling people to fish. I mean, I basically am fishing uh, vicariously through them. I mean, my right. you know, I'm telling them every cast when to tighten up mend downstream a little bit and then sometimes we'll have them instead of mending upstream the problem with people want to let's say it's a little deeper run 
and you mend upstream, well, then they might uh, they they're not going to see the strike if they get it because most of this is feel right it's not visual it's feel so you strip right. it tight and then just kind of lift the line take the fly line out of the water a little bit and just lift it up and drop it down nice and light so you still t- stay tight to the flies but they can sink at a little better rate and i mean i when i'm guiding i talk people through every literally every cast and i tell them if they once they get sick of me then they can just say john shut up we want to relax <laughs> for a few minutes and, and that's okay because really i figure my job is to do whatever i can to maximize their opportunity and that's what we do yeah, that's awesome. And and typically on that streamer setup, how long of a leader are you fishing and uh, are you using a floating line or sinking line? It's, these are great questions, Jay. Um, you know, we we rarely – because we're fishing out of boats, we rarely ever put a sinking line on. If anything, a five-foot uh, sink tip – I know we sell some of these little Orvis uh, streamer tips. They're five feet, I think, maybe seven feet. Anything more yeah. than that, you know – what, as I mentioned earlier, it's all about getting your fly to the fish every time. And if you have a, a full sinking line or a 10 or 15 foot head, hell, by the time you've got that back up into the guides where you can cast it again, I've already put three three shots in there on the sweet spot. So we're yeah. using all floating lines. In it. And another thing, we fish uncomfortably close to the fish. So we use short leaders. Nine feet would be maximum. You know, I rarely use anything more than nine feet, seven and a half foot leaders are not uncommon at all to the first fly. And the reason that is because we, some good, good fly casters, they come fishing with us and I try to explain to them straight away. I'm like, look, what you need to do is shorten up your line because we rarely cast 25 or 30 feet from the boat. Most of our casts literally are under 20 feet, a rod half out. And that's how you get more shots in the best water. Because don't you feel like you can – the closer you can get, the more efficient your shot can be yeah. and the quicker you can pull up and hit it again with another shot? Because, I mean, you tell me what you think, but when I'm streamer fishing, a lot of times it's just cast, you know, one, two, three, kind of bam, recast, one, two, three, kind of, yep. and keep moving. And you keep moving. If you can get an inside where you get a good, you're just on that inside current line, and maybe it's just going right down the seam, then maybe maybe we'll leave it in there, Right. But we right. want to keep it real short so our hookups are better, too. And along yeah. that line, I will mention that I wasn't real hot on these double hook streamers. But we've done some little tests lately, and I'm telling you, they hook more fish. <laughs> yeah. Those big articulated streamers, we use a lot of those now. Even smaller ones, you know, they just – you're not tearing fish up. We don't want to do that. But uh, they'll – they seem to hook up on that second hook a little better. So we want, you know, it's all about, it's one thing to get a a bunch of yanks, but not catch any fish. So a shorter line, you're going to have more hookups. You're tighter to the fly the whole time. You're just going to catch more fish. What would you say to someone that's streamer fishing and they're getting a ton of follows and bumps, but they're not actually uh, getting hookups? Would you tell them to switch flies? What would you tell them to do? Yeah, try that uh, double hook streamers or put a – chances are they're using a single fly. A lot of times we get that, they'll come up and I can see them when the water's clear and I can see them come up and they just kind of hit the hit the streamer. They don't strike it. They're just bumping it. And you can feel that because these rods are so amazingly, uh, uh, you know, uh, the finesse of these rods. You can feel anything on them, right? But they're not really grabbing it. So then we'll put on a small little – black bugger or a little olive bugger behind it something a little smaller maybe that sand one worm trailer and that tends to get them to grab on a little tighter so that's if we're we're getting strikes and we're not hooking them up we put that second fly on there which i always do anyway or we'll try that that uh that double hook uh streamer which those those things work really well absolutely um great stuff there um john what's your thought on um you know, you're you're putting on the second fly. Are they then hitting the second fly, or does it just make them hit the the first streamer harder? Uh, hey, you're you're talking about using two. At, do they hit the second one more, or, the, or are they just grabbing onto that streamer harder? No, I think I think it does both. I, I think that the uh, the second fly, you know, I, it's amazing. We can fish one fly. And you'll get a certain number of fish to eat it, and you put a second fly on it, and they tend to, you tend to catch more fish on both. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a real fan. The only time I really use a single fly is if I'm stripping really fast, um, more midsummer, late summer kind of streamer fishing, which is very uh, kind of weather specific. Then you kind of need typically you need uh, 
you know, windy, rainy, hail kind of conditions to really get them active where they're chasing. And then you can actually use maybe even a mouse or something on the surface. But most of the time I, um, you know, I only I use two flies unless I'm stripping really fast or I'm fishing really tight with dry flies right up against the bank. And I don't want anything to have any drag issues with a second fly. Other than that, we just use two flies all the time. I just it just works. And yeah, it just doubles your chance. I mean, you know, you teach them to, to take their time with their back cast, and uh, it, it shouldn't you – know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like to use – you know, I don't like to use a dropper or something. It really is just a matter of, of teaching people to, to be a little little more timely on their back cast and relax, open up their loop a little bit, and you shouldn't get tangled any. Yeah, yeah, awesome stuff. Uh, when I fished with you years ago, you were using a little uh, a fish release tool – I think you were making them out of wine cork, oh, yeah. and yeah, literally you would bring a fish to the boat and reach down. It slides down the line, and then you just pop it, and it it, it was awesome. Yeah. It, are are you still using? We that? are, and we're we're trying. We I've got a big bucket of wine corks just to spring on our list of things to do, which never gets done. Um, because we're always putting out fires. We were going to make a bunch of those <laughs> and just have them in the shop, and we might have some of those, but it is. Single handedly, and then this is now Jay. I don't want to for a second take anybody's uh, uh, thunder here. I did not develop that. There was a, and I don't know who this guy is. He's he guided years and years ago on the McKinsey River, and that was his design. And I I've seen a couple. You know, there's a bunch of different things out there. The catch and release and some other stuff, and and they work to a point. But this little tool you're talking about, they're easy to make. You take a wine cork or two if you'd like. Take some. Uh, a gauge, and I should know the exact gauge of the wire, but a uh, aluminum welding rod works pretty well. If you're using, just if you're on a tailwater and using a lot of small nymphs, just a clothes hanger wire works great. That's the perfect size. But for most of our fishing, we use from size 16 up, right, all the way to twos. So right. we want one tool to use all that. That's the problem I have with the little catch and release. Sometimes we use these great big foam flies, and they just don't go around it. This thing, you just take about... Uh, eight or ten inches of that wire, stick it right through the cork, all right? Make sure you haven't just consumed all that wine right before you do it because you run it through your hand. <laughs> but, uh, if you cut it with a with a pair of wire snips, it'll come at kind of a sharp point and just run it right through the wine cork. And if you want a bigger handle, you can put it through two wine corks, right through the middle of them, and then take a pair of pliers and bend the back end over really tight like uh, just about the size of the front of a pair of needle nose pliers. So when you pull that down into the cork, it doesn't spin. So at this point, you would have, if you did a double cork one, which I like, it gives you more room for your hand, you'd have two corks on a wire with the the top end of it bent in and stuck down in the top of the cork. And then you just have a, a straight piece sticking out of these two cork handles, and it won't spin because that little piece has been over. And then just take and bend that, wire around and leave about a two inch or three inch loop and it just kind of comes up against the straight piece you just bend it back around on itself it's kind of hard to explain but it is pretty simple and as you mentioned what's great about this is you just drop that right onto the leader and i actually grab the leader and slide it right down to the hook and when you do that obviously we never use barbed hooks so we always use barbless hooks so as soon as it touches the hook, you're actually lifting that right out of the uh, the fish's mouth. It just falls off instantly. And I can, I mean, if I don't have that now, I feel like I'm fishing naked. I mean, I've got to have that in my hand every day. Um, it's just critical, you know. And, and for us, you know, we use a lot of big flies, right? So we don't want to tear these fish up. So it's just critical that we don't handle them. Shocked at how, how well it worked. I might have you send me a photo of that. And when I post this episode up, maybe I'll include a photo there and, and with the links there to your, your shop and such. Um, yeah. Tell me about your fishing conditions now. Uh, how are things going? What is hatching? What are the fish doing? What are the flows? What's going on right now on the waters you're fishing? Well, uh, as you know, you know, Missoula has, it's only at 3,500 feet in elevation here, which coming from Colorado, which is, you know, I think the lowest it ever is where, where I used to fish was it. 7,000 feet or something. So we have the best, even in, in Bozeman, for instance, they're at 6,000 feet. So they have a lot more uh, cold weather than we do. So our fishing starts typically about mid-March and runs through the middle of October. Um, but right now, we are, we've are we been fishing dry flies really uh, pretty much every day since March 11th or 10th. Um, and that's been a, I'd say, 
this has been the best dry fly spring I've seen in years. And the reason is, is the water is a little higher. We've had, we haven't had any snow in Missoula for nine weeks. And the low snow is melted off. So bump the rivers are usually up. The Bitterroot, for instance, usually about 800 cubic feet per second. But now it's running 16 to 2,000. So that makes for better dry fly fishing because those fish aren't so nervous. When it's running five or 600 or 800, they're really nervous and they're hard to catch. And they, you know, and it gets hit hard. And I realize a lot of people in Missoula and the, the valley here in the, the Bitterroot Valley, they know that the fishing is so good in the spring that everybody's got the fever and they all are done skiing and they want to go fishing. So these fish get hit pretty hard. And there is a squala stonefly catch. I think if I remember right, when your wife and yourself came out, you were fishing the golden stones and the yellow stallies. Yeah. So the yeah. squala is very similar to that golden stone that we were fishing, but just about one size smaller and more of a dirty olive to slate gray. And uh, they are at early stone play. We have two or three other smaller, lesser stones that are hatching right now as well. But the squall is the big one that people really key on. And then um, when I was on the river day before yesterday, we had these big squall of stone flies. We had a lutridae, which is a little brown stone, kind of a thin needle stone. Uh, we had midges early and then blooming olives came out and then the March brown mayflies came out too. So it was a plethora of bugs. It was the best, uh, the the best hatch day I've seen this season. And you know, today or tomorrow, I'm on the river again, and I it's going to be cloudy and it's going to be in the mid 50s, and I think it's going to be exceptional. It's it's been, I would have to say, the best dry fly spring I've seen in three or four years. That's awesome. How long do you anticipate that stain like that, uh, or maybe until the runoff starts? How long How long will you have where the fishing will still be lights out? Well, you know what's going to happen, Jay, is here at about the third week of April, um, we're going to even have more bugs out. Those All those bugs I just mentioned are going to be continuing to come on. There's also, uh, which are probably happening right now on the lower Clarkford, but not as much on the Bitterroot and the Blackfoot, are the uh, big Amelitis. It's a great big gray drake. Um, literally like a size 12. You can use the size 12 parachute atoms. It matches it perfectly. Um, those will be coming out. But the shortcoming with that is the later, the third to fourth week in April, you get then that spawning time in Montana, right? So most of those rainbows and some of the cutties, they're already going up the creeks to spawn. So you're actually okay. fishing to a lot smaller segment of the fish. Yeah, right? There just aren't as many fish there. So it's kind of frustrating for some people. They'll come in early March or early May, excuse me, and they will be beautiful hatches all over and we'll get a few big browns a couple of rainbows a couple of cutties but they just aren't many fish there um this year i don't anticipate so i think it will see a slowdown just because the fish aren't in the river but i don't anticipate much of a runoff um i i didn't look i meant to try to uh check the the uh, snow tell report you know that tells yeah. how much water content there is in the snow here i was going to do that yesterday and i didn't get a chance to but um, my sense of it, we've got to be running around 80, 90 percent of, of snowpack now um, uh, for annual, you know, as opposed to the annual uh, history. Sure. And sure. boy, I think we're going to see a, an amazing salmon fly fishing this year, right in the last week of May, early June, when a lot of times we're high and muddy, you know, and, and I don't have a crystal ball, right? I mean, Normally, who knows? We it could snow for the next three weeks, and we could go 150 percent. Right. But the way things are looking right now, I think we're going to see some really good salmon fly fishing. Maybe the best we've seen in years, because many times three quarters of salmon flies uh, hatch is during high water when it's muddy and you don't catch any fish. Sure, absolutely. We'll and, and this year. I think that's one of the common themes across the West. Is one of the best hatches of the year yeah. happens at high water and the water's off color and while those fish are still in pockets feeding and such, it's, you know, everybody can't just go out and catch fish. Yeah, um, really. You know, the good guides can, but it, 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 it definitely, uh, high water definitely puts a hamper, a, a damper on that. It makes um, it really tough, you know, those green drakes hatch then too, right? You yeah. don't ever get, I'd say one out of four years do we get good green, green drake hatch uh, or green drake fishing because of the high water right. that we're speaking of. But this year, you know, Boy, I, I really am looking forward to it because I think that we could see some really good green, green drake fishing too. That's awesome. And then so once runoff happens uh, and then y y you've got the big salmon fly season, uh, and then what do you transition to, at, you know, timing-wise most of, most of on an average type year or, an av or a year like we're going to have here, which is you're thinking it's going to be a little bit less than 100%. 
Um, what kind of transition do you have then in, with, with your progression of hatching? Well, right immediately following the salmon fly hatch, and even as it tails off, then the golden stones and the yellow sallies that you all fished here a few years ago, those are going to be coming out along with the, the pale morning duns, the little PMDs. And those are going to happen no matter what. Now, if the water gets really low and clear, it could be a little trickier to catch fish on those, I think, because, you know, the there that's a really popular time. I would say July is... Uh, is our busiest guide season, and there's a reason for that. It's safe, sure. right? You know, the water is going to be down. There's going to be hatches. And then so through about the third week of July, that stuff should continue on. And then then kind of in the summer, now this year we're a little nervous because we don't know what our snowpack's going to, you know, what it's all going to hold. But and then you kind of lose hatches. Toward the end of, end of July, then those hatches just kind of dissipate. There's a uh, nocturnal stonefly, big golden stone that hatches all summer. And sometimes they'll eat that. Uh, but then it turns to more hopper fishing, kind of attractors. We use a lot of uh, long droppers, big fat prints then for a Montana prince or, or the San Juan worms don't work as well when the water gets warm. So that kind of turns off. Yeah. But then we use a lot of dry dropper fishing until later in August when we get the, the trichos. Um, then we can fish trico hatches in the morning and hoppers in the afternoon, which is a fun time to fish. Yeah, that's uh, the trico can always be fun because they get real consistent. Um, are you fishing trico spinners when when that happens uh, primarily, or, or or how do you how do you tackle the tricos? Because I know they can be very finicky. They they can, and um, you know to be honest, you know, luckily for us, unlike let's say if you're on the Missouri, which are the trico hatches are awesome, right? We guide over there a bit, and they're I mean, there'll be cylinders that look like smoke. There's so many hatches of, of trichos and the spinners and the fish get really finicky with their only male spinners. And it's just nonsense. It's horrible. So hard. But here, they're typically pretty easy. We're more meat and potatoes. If I can put on a parachute uh, trico in most situations, as long as the body's thin on it, um, it's going to catch fish. And then we can even put a little hopper just about uh, like a number number 12 or, or 14 hopper or about 15 inches in front of it and then we can even if we can't see the fly if we want to use a spinner then we can still see when you know the county rule applies anything within the county of the hopper each you know it's on your spinner and you give it a little lift <laughs> and you've probably got them so y- sure. you can use spinners and the fish here we're lucky enough that they just they aren't quite as as educated i guess um as some of those tailwater uh trico fishing situations but at the same time heaven say that jay we don't have those just call you know just big smoke filled mornings yeah, yeah. Of, of millions and millions of tricos yeah 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 you do have yeah. incredible fishing there lots of water to fish uh, just abundant hatches uh all throughout the year um of your fishing season it was uh, awesome to talk to you today. John, I want to give you a chance to let people know how they can get a hold of you, where they can find your guide service, your shop, and the whole thing. Can you give me that? Certainly. Yeah, we, we, we're we found on the web at uh, blackfootriver.com. Makes it real simple. And through there, people can order stuff. Hopefully, we'll have some of these little uh, hook releases. I'm not going to guarantee it because I thought it was going to happen in the last two months, but it hasn't. <laughs> uh, but we should certainly talk later about getting you a picture of those because I really I want people to use them because it's it's good for fish and that means it's good for us and it's good for everybody, right? We want to yeah. we don't want to hurt those fish. And one thing I wanted to mention too, Jay. I don't know, you know, I haven't had a chance to really review all your podcasts to date, but. You know, I think it's really important that people know that in Missoula these and in Montana, these are all wild fish. So all the fish that we're catching, they're completely wild. There's no stocking in the rivers of Montana. So it is it's pretty awesome that we can go down the Blackfoot and you catch a 22-inch brown trout. Those are kind of those top-end browns. And it might be a seven- or eight-year-old fish, maybe a little more. And that thing was born and bred in the in the river and in the tributaries of those uh, of the Blackfoot. It's pretty special stuff. Absolutely, and, and not only that, you you know you've got brown rainbows, cutthroats. I mean, you have a, a wide variety of fish there, and and you know the color of the fish there is amazing, and and uh, Montana is absolutely a, a real special place to fish for sure. Yeah. So um, uh, and, and, Black Blackfootriver dot com is your website, um, and then. What else? Where else can they? Phone number. You could you could reach us by phone. We have an awesome staff here. We really worked hard to get these great people that work for us, and they are they're savvy anglers. They're nice people. They know what they're talking about. They give straight skinny to anybody that calls. 
Um, and the number what what is that number, John? Four zero six five. Or it's yeah five four two seven four one one. That's four zero six five four two seven four one one. Right on. Oh, and um, have, also on Facebook or Instagram? Yeah, we have a uh, Blackfoot River Outfitters page on Facebook. We keep that up to date pretty much two or three times a week, maybe four times a week with all the happenings that are here. Um, we have a blog on our website that uh, we try to keep updated. It gets busy and sometimes we don't keep it up. But if, if we have an exceptional day or we want to show somebody some new techniques or something, we usually put a blog post on there. Um, usually our Facebook page is the best way to keep updated. People can just click on liking us and then when we send stuff in they uh they get that information awesome and i know um for a long time uh you and your wife were doing uh videos kind of uh fishing reports uh weekly and and um are you still doing that yeah those those reports so as as it turns out we're literally as we speak we're having our our website completely revamped so it's still up but the new one's going to be really slick, really fun, um, real sharp. We have some local people that actually the guy that ever that did my first uh, first brochure ever is is doing this, and he's a real sharp guy. And so that's we're going to reinstitute that because we ran into some problems uh, getting it uploaded. It just took too long. So he's sure. taking care of that. So hopefully by it'll probably my guess it'll be early June before we really get those uh, video reports up, but they're fun. I mean, I'm an easy target. My wife gives me a hard time. We should go <laughs> fishing and, uh, and have some good laughs. So it's a, it's a good thing too. That's awesome stuff. There you have it. John Herzer, Blackfoot river outfitters, Missoula, Montana, uh, 400 miles of floatable fishable water and un you know, just all kinds of uh, walk and way, just uh, Spring Creek type fishing and, and opportunities. Uh, if you guys are ever in the Missoula area, uh, give John a call and uh, he has the best guides in Montana. And, um, you know, we've fished with several of them and just had a ball when we were there and um, just a wealth of knowledge. And, and uh, thank you for being on the show. And Maybe I'll have to check back in a couple months and kind of get an updated report and um, talk to you again. And I just want to thank you for being on and, and uh, tell, uh, I understand you're going turkey hunting maybe in a week or so. I, I wish you the best on that. Yeah, I'm going to take my, my son. We can't, you can't hunt in Montana until you're 12, but uh, we can drive over the pass to Idaho. So we patterned his 28 gauge over and under last night and, He's a 10-year-old. That's awesome, John. Well, sounds good. Thanks for being with us. Thanks again, Jay. Really appreciate it. That was awesome getting to spend time with Blackfoot River Outfitters guide and operator, John Herzer, good friend. Um, hope you guys learned something from that episode. Love fishing streamers. Love fishing Montana. I uh, wanted to end today uh, John Bingham with the Broadhead Br Brotherhood Facebook group uh, is putting on a Shoot for Hope 3D archery fundraiser at Ben Avery. I'm going to cut into an interview that I did with him uh, describing the shoot. Uh, hopefully you guys can make it out there and uh, raise some money. Uh, I want to thank all the listeners for listening and until next time, God bless. Online and they're doing a fundraiser for Shoot for Hope on April 18th at Ben Avery. It's going to be a 3D archery shoot. Um, it's going to be a friendly, non-competitive, you know, just for a good cause. Uh, John, how you doing today? Hey, Jay, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Why don't you tell me a little bit about this Broadhead Brotherhood uh, Shoot for Hope uh, uh, benefit that that's going on? Okay, uh, just a just a quick history. Um, you know, anybody who's who's been involved with the battle of, with cancer uh, at their cancer treatment center knows that. Uh, they have a great group of volunteers out there, and uh, that organization is a 5013C, uh, and they operate strictly on uh, uh, charity money. Um, my wife was a patient there, so we wanted to do something to tell them thank you for all their hard work, and uh, we decided, you know, the best way to uh, to do it and stay, um, you know, something archery and hunting related, uh, we'd put on a, a 3D shoot, and uh, we figured, you know, April, everybody's kind of gearing up. They've got their notification that they have, they have an elk tag and get ready for deer tags and all that. So why not get out and do some uh, do some practice uh, at a bunch of good targets and, and get out and have a good time. 
enjoy the sunshine and support a great group of people. That's awesome, John. Uh, where can people reach you? Where can they hear more about uh, the, the Shoot for Hope uh, tournament? And uh, how can they connect with you? Um, there's two places they can do that. Um, where I'm uh, leading up to the shoot, I'm pretty much, you know, at least once a day uh, putting out information about uh, where you can sign up and, and uh, save $5 on pre-registration. And and you can do that one of two ways. Uh, one, you can follow our, our Facebook page, which is Broadhead Brotherhood Shoot for Hope. And if you do a search, it should come right up on top. And also, you can join our group uh, under the same name, uh, Broadhead Brotherhood. Um, it's a pretty large archery-based uh, uh, group. Uh, and, you know, and it's uh, people from all over the nation and a few countries outside the U.S. So... Uh, those are the two main resources of where you can find information on the shoot. Awesome. And that's April 18th. Uh, is that a Saturday? Yes, sir. April 18th. We're going to start at 7 a.m. Uh, we'll wrap up at 4 p.m. Um, you don't have to be there right at 7 unless you just want to uh, stay out of the heat a little bit. Um, we'll run it all day long until the last guy goes through. Um, it's open to all classifications, whether you're a traditional archer or, uh, you know, uh, an experienced uh, compound bow shooter or uh, somewhere in between. It's going to be open for everybody. We're not going to discriminate at you. Um, Non-competitive, fun. Uh, We'll give you a scorecard if you're one of those guys that likes to keep uh, a score. And uh, the icing on the cake of this whole deal is I have probably over $5,000 worth of uh, gear to raffle off to everybody, and that ranges from... Uh, uh, a prime bow, Hoyt Ignite, uh, uh, Kuyu, who I'm, who I know you're a big fan of, Jay. Um, uh, a mule deer hunt out in Utah. So there's all kinds of really good incentives to show up. That's fantastic. I know you've got uh, support from the Arizona Bow Hunters Association and and other places. Uh, this is a great cause. All of the money is going to go back to. Uh, the 5013C, is that correct? That is correct. Um, there are some administrative fees that we have from uh, Arizona Game and Fish uh, because they're letting us use their facility, but that's minimal. Uh, okay. and how, how many targets uh, will there be at the course? Uh, there will be no less than 60 targets to shoot at. Great. Ranging from distances from, what, 10 to 50 yards? 10 to 50 yards, and then we'll maybe even further, uh, we'll – uh, as we're planning this, we're going to uh, uh, lay out the targets and, and just see what works out there. And awesome. we will have a long shoot competition. Um, that's the only competitive part of the whole thing. And uh, that's where you can win the bow and a custom buckle uh, for the high, high score. Awesome. We'll go to Broadhead Brotherhood Shoot for Hope on Facebook and connect with John. Uh, join Broadhead Brotherhood uh, Facebook group. And uh, show up on April 18th at Ben Avery from 7 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. Is that correct, 4? Yes, sir. And uh, have some fun, raise some money, uh, bring, it's going to be available to all ages, so um, uh, bring the kids out, and, correct? Yes, sir, bring, bring everybody. Good, bring everybody, let's raise some money, and I want to thank you for doing this, John, and is there anything else that uh, people need to know? No, that's it. Um, I really appreciate you letting me uh, uh, talk about it, and and, uh, I really enjoy your podcast, and I'm sure everybody else does too. Well, I appreciate the kind words, and uh, let's, uh, let's raise some money out there. Broadhead Brotherhood Shoot for Hope, April 18th at Ben Avery Shooting Range. Thanks for listening to the J. Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today.